Okay. Um, in the recent film, uh, you said that 1991 was the year that Pung broke. Oh, yeah. And <coughs> how much do you identify Sonic Youth with the values of Pung and the Pung? Well, movement? only because we we are of the age where we were very um, kind of excited and enlightened by uh, what was going on in 1977, as far as people just sort of denying the mainstream and not really bonding to it. And, uh, that's about it. I mean, <coughs> that movie was it was a very satirical, cynical kind of uh, view, view on the whole thing and um, sort of taking the piss from it. But, uh, um, See, Sonic Youth has come from the ranks. I mean, you, you really work your way up. You know. Uh, is it harder for an indie band to play music today? Harder? Yeah. Not now. Now it's actually really kind of uh, uh, easier for an independent band to exist today. Only because there's so much interest in, uh, in the independent music scene from uh, from those in the high castle looking down. <laughs> Whereas before it was always looked upon as a, an aberration or a novelty. Um, it was, or it was just misunderstood. I mean, that's what the independent scene, I mean, is what the whole punk rock scene was. It was just something that did not subscribe to the values of, of the mainstream, which was, you know, competitiveness and, and hierarchy. And uh, it was more of a, of, a, of a community that created a network of, of just joining in and doing music for each other that you enjoyed, and it was, it was serious. And uh, now that you have... The popularity of Nirvana and Lollapalooza and all these kind of events, I mean, <coughs> the mainstream is very interested because they see money there. And they see excitement, you know, for the mainstream, but um, I think it's a lot easier for an independent band now to exist because they, they, you get a lot more uh, notice and you're kind of, in the mainstream industry, you're the independent music musician is all of a sudden now he's validated as being authentic, whereas before he was just sort of considered to be um, a novelty. So that's kind of exciting, and that's kind of a good change of events. And nobody really thought this in the early 80s that this would ever happen. I mean, even serious bands in America like X or... Um, or television, or Patti Smith. I mean, all these musics were considered to be very left field, mm -hmm. and to think that someday there would be a band of uh, like Nirvana, who would just be these kids off the street who were very poor, and, and just made this music that was very involved with, uh, you know, one point Black Flag and one point Bubblegum Pop, or whatever. To make it so huge, you would have never thought so, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen because the industry wanted to make it happen. It happened by itself, you know, and uh, that was really interesting. But, you know, isn't it ironic that um, currently a lot of the independent labels have died, like Factory or you know, Rough Trade? Yeah, in a sense it is because they sort of were very interested in... Um, in creating such an alternative to the main to the mainstream, but at the same time they were also very interested in becoming the mainstream if they could, and so their image was always very perverse because they knew that was kind of an impossibility in a way, although they bought into uh, becoming um, uh, large labels. Like Factory always had an ambition to become very huge, mm -hmm. although I think they always knew that that was somewhat of an impossibility. Um, same with Rough Trade, uh, and so I think through all that work that they did in the in the, the late seventies and the eighties was very important, um, and it is kind of ironic now that a smaller a label can just start right now that's independent and if with the right kind of business sense they can become very huge if they wanted to be just by buying into them to a, a major label and um, yeah, it is kind of ironic in a way I think they'll. The rough trade and factory will always be looked upon as as, uh, as very interesting kind of artistic labels in a way, mm -hmm. um, which I liked because they never lost their sense of worth by being uh, in the limelight. Uh, <coughs> so. Okay.
Okay, uh, what happened to Blast First? Uh, after your left, I mean, you, you don't really hear of Blast, Blast First anymore. Well, it, it was well? that was just sort of a, a s I mean, Blast First was created to put out Bad Moon Rising in the mid 80s, and um, it was basically one person, uh, Paul Smith, who used to work with Cabaret Voltaire um, on a label called Double Vision. And he created Blast First to put out this American band, which was us, because I sent him the music and I said, Are you interested in Sonic Youth being on Double Vision? Because I was looking for any kind of chance to put music out. And he was very interested, but Cabaret Voltaire was not. So he created this label, Blast First, uh, solely to put Sonic Youth record out. And it did very well for him. He got a lot of attention. It seemed it was something new in England because in England, at that point in time, they turned a complete blind eye on American music because they weren't interested in in bands that played guitars or traditional aspects of rock and roll. They were into some bizarre, which was you know this whole thing of um, of doing more sort of theatric kind of uh, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, industrial music and uh, getting away from any kind of traditionalism and just playing synthesizers and, and uh, so it was an affront to that kind of uh, scene in London and the people, the audience, the youth that went to see music were drawn to Sonic Youth in a way that they were not drawn to Test Department so there was like this schism there and he really saw that and we were very influential to Paul Smith at Blast First. We uh, we told him about Big Black and Buffalo Surfers. I see. Um, and uh, he put these records out. But uh, down the line, uh, what happened is that um, there was just sort of a very uh, simple relationship problem there. I mean, um, we had certain ideas about how we wanted to continue with our our livelihood, and he uh, had uh, different opinions, and so we uh, we just sort of split. And he continued Blast First, but he didn't really have Sonic Youth mm -hmm. guiding him as far as like what music. And uh, so I don't think it, okay, it, it, sort, of, it sort of lost that kind of. Was your thing. input in Blast First a very strong input? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. As far as any kind of A and R decision going on there, I think we were very influential. And I think it's obvious when we left that mm -hmm. that left with it. So, I mean, I, you know. Is this what prompted you to start Aesthetic Records? Ecstatic Peace, well, Ecstatic Peace always existed. And uh, I created Ecstatic Peace in the early 80s just mm -hmm. out of my bedroom when I was making cassette duplications of uh, a cassette I made called Sonic Death. Yeah, that's right. Which was just a bunch of live cassettes and I just collage them onto a really little shitty kind of normal cassette <laughs> I had a lot of hiss on it and then I'd make copies from it yes, yes. and that was ecstatic piece and I also did another cassette with spoken word by Lydia Lunch mm -hmm. and um, before that that was the first one but uh, it had no ambition or any focus it was just sort of a, um, a title I used to give mm -hmm. uh, a sense of identity to the release, I mean, the Ecstatic Peace was the name of the record label, and oh. I never had any uh, ambition that it was going to become some kind of... But see, lately you've got a gr group like Cell, mm. which you released mm. early on, and then they are now signed on to Gethard. Right. So do you see um, Aesthetic sort of like as a jumping board for bands? Well, it could be. It could be anything. I mean, Ecstatic Peace is not owned by anybody except for me, uh -huh. and Geffen Records wanted to buy Ecstatic Peace to create their own little... Uh, fake indie. This is a big <laughs> uh, on you know, which is like pretty funny. But um, I refused to do that. I let them do it for sale just because I thought it was kind of it was okay. I mean, for the first release. Um, but that's it. Are the band signed to you? No, nobody signed aesthetic? to me. You know, Exotic Peace doesn't sign artists at all. Okay. So what is your arrangement with the bands? Well, we have a um, a talent scout agreement with mm -hmm. Geffen in America. And what that entails is that we can bring acts forward to Geffen and say, here's a band that you might find interesting and they're interested in working with you. And uh, our sole purpose is to make sure the band gets a, um, a decent, fair deal. 
that's about it. And uh, we don't take any of the band's money. We get like a couple of points on their recording, and we get a finder's fee that does not go against the money that they're uh, <coughs> advanced. So, you know, it's, it was an idea that was propositioned to us by uh, somebody in our managerial team saying, you know, for the last few years in all these interviews and Melody Maker and, and in me, you talk about Dinosaur Jr. and Babes in Toyland and, and Nirvana or whatever, and these A&R men with their cigars and their feet on the desk read this, pick up the phone and sign them up, and they make millions of dollars. It's like, maybe you should sort of, you know, before you start yapping about a, a little band that you like, maybe you should sort of talk to the band yourself and see if they're interested in doing a deal with you. So we thought that was a pretty good idea. But we didn't really want to get involved with any... I mean, we don't want to get involved with any competitiveness um, in the business. It's not We're not interested in that at all. I mean, at first we wanted to sign Mud Honey. And, but the label kind of uh, wasn't that interested. So we said, okay, if you're not interested, then it's not worth it to Mud Honey for them to work with you. So. Okay. Um, no, What's going on? <laughs> 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 Is that why you like uh, labels like Discord? Because like they are making music for the love of music. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean all labels start out that way. I think. I mean, some of them start out just on a greed basis, like let's make money off of the music industry. But if anybody wants to make yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's why we always ignore the mainstream labels anyway, because they had no interest in the, in the, the music. I mean, they were more interested in just selling. Mm. So. Uh, okay, I've got the... Do you expect to keep playing your type of music till you're, say, 40 or like the Rolling mm. Stones? Well, I don't know how long Sonic Youth will stay together, but I, I, I personally can, will... Always sort of play music, yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, over the years, do you see a change or progression in the music? In our music, yeah, that's right. Um, it's become more. Uh, it's become more rock and roll in a way, um, which is kind of interesting because uh, you know, rock and roll is such. Uh, you know, we grew up with. And we love it so much that I think we've become more of a rock and roll band, less of an experimental uh, kind of venture. Um, which is kind of uh, interesting, but at the same time, I sort of want to get away from, uh, from that in a way. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think we've just become more proficient. We've become more sort of kind of set in our ways as far as our relationship with each other. And so there's less of the um, there's less of a newness to the music making. So I mean that's obvious. But um, I think right now what's going to happen is I think um, we'll probably get more radical in a way, and less away from kind of uh, any hints at uh, kind of. Normalcy. <laughs> okay, because I want to go to that. See, um, compared to your earlier albums, say Dirty, has got more message in it. Mm -hmm. Is it because it was an election year? Or yeah, possibly. Or I mean, because your songwriting has sort of like sh shifted to well, you want to talk about most so called yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's all to us. I mean, we've always sort of had um, those kind of feelings in the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So it's just like I think this time around, there was a couple of songs that were very explicit. And very that's straightforward, right. yeah, right. and I think we, what, the reason that those songs existed was because it was something different to to do, and it was something new. And it's just like, you know, I think I'll write these lyrics very, extremely straightforward and, and explicit like that, just to uh, do it because I've never really written that way before, and just mm -hmm. to, um, it's kind of a new dynamic. And so that was just something we introduced to the music. Um, it's. Yeah, and also the, there were serious concerns of ours, but they always have been. It was not s some bandwagon we jumped on uh -huh. as far as like this political correctness uh -huh. kind of deal. Um, it's it was just uh, it was just us sort of joining in in the empowerment of this kind of ideal. That's about it. Okay. Um, 
Uh, do you see the the last election as a watershed year for American? Yeah, mm. only because it got rid of uh, the Republican stronghold on the government, you know, which we always thought was detrimental and kind of um, extremist in its right wing value system that it tried to impose on the rest of America regardless of their lifestyle. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it it could very well be um, the last time. Uh, we had a Democrat in office, uh, it got kind of washed out, and it could very well happen again. Um, although I think this administration has more Republican concerns than people think as far as um, the way they want to deal with uh, the economy and, and, uh, but, and their world. But you didn't uh, no, come up. Is, is it frightening that Tipagol is, is in a position of influence <laughs> She's yeah. always been in, in position of influence just because of her association with her husband. Um, mm. But I think uh, <coughs> she was kind of um, extremely misled by a lot of extremist uh, people around her and I, and I believe that um, in this administration I think they really wanted to downplay Tipper Gore's involvement with any uh, kind of censorship um, and I don't think she really saw the uh, the the, impl the the real harm that she could have caused to <laughs> to like uh, American you know music culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it was funny. I mean, it's just like no way is she gonna like really affect it that much. I mean, she might affect people who sell millions of records, like Bruce Springsteen, from being in chain stores because he says fuck or, or something like that, or. Um, but he, she definitely has an effect on the rap. Yeah, right. No, I mean, it's like but that was bound to happen re without Tipper Gore. I mean, as soon as there was like a, a, a musical genre that sort of had factions that were coming out and doing whole albums about like, you know, uh, you know, abusing women or, <laughs> or you know, or having s explicit sex or, or you know, talking about like burning down the White House and. You know, uh -huh. killing policemen and, and killing cops. I mean, you know, you're, of course you're going to get that's a very extremist view, you know, created by like an oppressed society. So I mean, it's just like as soon as that starts happening, you are going to get the other side of the coin reacting um, at the at the head of the society, saying like, "Boom, no, let's cancel it without and without realizing where the problem really is." And uh, so, I mean, it's not surprising to me within the culture, but <laughs> it is kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so far, uh, you or any of your group members have sort of like stayed away from politics, you know, outwardly showing a support in that sense. Well, we've always supported what we've... Uh, we, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're not activists politically, mm -hmm. although we do sort of... Um, we do support what we think is like a, um, the correct way to go as far as like the um, you know the the, the socio political uh, future of, uh, of where we live. Um, okay. Do you ha uh, do you see this happening that the younger bands look up to Sonic Youth for guidance and direction? I think they we're kind of um, we we kind of uh, signify something. Just because of the, the maneuvers that we've made as a band and working with the record industry and keeping uh, true to ourselves, yeah, I think so. And um, do you find that a burden, or is that something? No, that no, because I feel very uh, confident in the way that we work, and uh, we would we if we've chosen uh, to be very aware of not selling ourselves short, um, you know, to any part of the industry and. Uh, so as long as, as long as that, uh, you know, is successful, then I think uh, I don't, I don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people look at us as 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 total sellouts in a way. I mean, there's a lot of bands that look at us like, oh, it's bullshit. You know, they were good ten years ago, but now they're just sort of like, you know, opening for Neil Young and making records for a major label and they see it very politically whereas we never really uh, drew any weird kind of uh, 
political line between small business and big business as far as making music. It's just like, as long as you stay true to yourself and, and don't deal with, you know, companies that are extremely corrupt as far as, like, you know, um, being harmful to any kind of, like, uh, subculture or whatever, which I don't think Geffen is to extent, although there's, I'm sure they are and to some extent. I mean, we're on the same label as Guns N' Roses, who are, who are just kind of rednecks, and I don't really... That's, I mean, I've always said if Guns N' Roses are, are, are uh, what rock and roll is all about, then we are not rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs>
and he was in our dressing room while Neil Young was on, and we had to tell him what songs Neil Young was playing. <laughs> <laughs> so I always wanted to write a letter to Rolling Stone and telling you about that situation, but uh, I never write letters to magazines. You finally appear in Yeah, maybe he'll read this. <laughs>